So um, Fabrice, I'm gonna, I've been working on the web for probably too long, uh, but, <laughs> um, and I want, I want to talk today about um, some challenges that come from uh, the current security and privacy model of the web and how um, content-based addressing can provide us some solutions to uh, come up with something better. Um, so uh, I'm gonna introduce some principle of web security, web privacy, describe some solutions we, we thought about, well, mostly Robin, and, and the implementation that I started to do in, in the context of Capilun, and uh, based on these experiments, some initial uh, thought about uh, is that a good idea? Is that something we should uh, push forward with? <clears throat> so the web security model, uh, a quick intro. I mean, it, the web is like almost 30 years old now. And, and that's a pretty amazing platform in terms of like, you can still load content that was created back then in, in the 19th. And uh, so it has evolved to uh, be ready for new use cases, new kind of apps, new APIs, and all that has been done while maintaining some kind of pretty good backward compatibility, which is uh, quite amazing. If you think about it, I think the only other platform that can pretend to do as well is Win32, <laughs> which is kind of amazing because that's a very polar opposite in terms of openness overall, but, but they've been doing a good job at uh, backward compatibility. But so uh, when, when you think about web security, people always think, oh, it's very complicated. It, it's not done the right way and so on. But keep in mind that it keeps running the thing that was done in the 90s. Um, so that that's obviously comes with a, a bunch of uh, constraints. And one of the most important uh, principles for web security is what, what's called the same origin policy. So it's, it's a set of rules uh, that describes what happens when you want to mix and match content that comes from different origins. An origin being, roughly speaking, a different server or a different host name. Uh, and, and this principle states that only the site that stores some information in the browser may later read or modify that information. So it's not just like fetching content from some other places. It's like what happens once you fetched some content. So for instance, <coughs> if, you, if you load an image, you can load cross-origin images. You, you do that all the time on the web. But if you load an image from a different origin, you cannot read the pixels of this image. You'd get a security error if you try to do that. Um, scripts are uh, uh, also very interesting uh, on that, on that, in, by that regard is that you can load, load scripts from various origin in the same page and all the code ends up being in the same namespace, which is kind of, I mean, are good sides and by sides. So obviously that, that makes easier to uh, combine libraries together, but that also means that you can have conflicts and without the same origin policy, that would mean that like aside from a, a, a malicious uh, origin could exfilter information to its own <coughs> uh, origin. Um, with some APIs, you can just not uh, retrieve content cross origins, like with uh, XML HTTP requests or fetch. Uh, we'll see how we can actually do it later, but, and, and from uh, iframes, you can use post message if you're cross origin, which means that, that the both sides can verify who's sending messages. <clears throat> so uh, one, one issue that like you can run into when you load scripts from different origins is that you have no real control over what is being uh, sent to you by the server. So you could, and same for images. We, there are countless uh, <laughs> examples of people replacing some image that was used by other websites, like for fun or uh, <laughs> Um, just to show that you should maybe not use content that is not uh, under your control. But for scripts, it's, it's, it, it can be pretty uh, bad if you end up with some uh, malicious script instead of uh, what you expected. One way to uh, work around that is to use what is called sub-resource integrity, which is basically specifying the hash of the script that you expect to load. And the browser will load the script 
verify the hash and only actually instantiate the script if the hash matches. I guess that that looks very close to CIDs for people in this room. And, and that's pretty close. Like you, you, you get a, a hash and, and you describe what kind of hash it is. It's all in, in plain text, right? But it's, it's very similar. <coughs> that means that the, the browser can actually do integrity checks in some situations. You, of course, you have like the issue of bootstrapping that because of the page that contains this uh, integrity value needs to be safe, but that, that's the first uh, good step. <coughs> so we've seen that uh, the same origin policy prevents you from, in general, loading cross-origin data. And, and sometimes it's uh, that use cases where it's legitimate that you want to do that or that the third party uh, API is, is, is uh, actually serve from a site you trust or you want to trust. So there's a mechanism to um, uh, allow that. It's, it's called course. It's cross-origin resource sharing. It's something that uh, people are usually pretty wary of. It, 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 the rules describe how it works as a bit, are a bit complex if you look at the specs. But overall, it means that like in some situations, the browser will not fetch directly the content. It will still, it will, it will first send what is called a pre-flight request, which is a special HTTP options request. And the server can respond with uh, a list of like origins that are allowed to load content from, from this server. Um, so on the server side, it's, it's relatively easy now to uh, set up. I think all the server side frameworks have support for that. Uh, in some way, so you can you can configure your server to access uh, to accept uh, course uh, sharing. I think the, the the main difficulty is to know how granular you want to be. Like, uh, it's very easy to allow everyone to fetch. It's it's a bit more tricky when you want to do something uh, more specific. <clears throat> then you have a a bunch of uh, security issues that can come from side channel attacks. And it's, it's both interesting and, and very tricky. Uh, it's everything that can happen without like using an explicit API. It's, it's stuff that is not, we, we have to defend against. It's like finding ways to extract information based on uh, in, indirect uh, observation of behavior of the browser, basically. And usually that's, that's something that people try to do to uh, know to learn about user navigation, about data that has been loaded from other sites. <clears throat> there are a bunch of various um, classes of attacks. Uh, in, in the old days, there was like cache timing attacks because you knew you, you, could, you could try to fetch content and if, if it was coming back very fast, it was very likely to be in the browser cache, which meant that you had visited this website before. Uh, that has been mitigated by all the runtimes by using a technique called uh, double keying of cache entries. So instead of using just the URL of the resource when you uh, put it in the cache, as a, the key that you use for the cache is the URL of the page, the referrer, and, and the resource itself, which means that you end up with like multiple copies potentially in the cache of the same resource, but at least you cannot uh, guess that much. <coughs> There were uh, yeah, attacks on, uh, for the history stuff or on looking at uh, CSS computing values because when, when you uh, have a link in a page, you can, you can use CSS to style it differently based on whether the user visited the page before or not. And so uh, an attacker could like, just create a page, put links in it, and, and guess if you had uh, been visiting these site, this sites before. Um, that has been mitigated also uh, by a, a bunch of different techniques, like lying basically to uh, like by, by sending back uh, fake information uh, as computed values, and by uh, preventing some CSS selector from having any uh, effect. Uh, there's a very good um, write-up about that by, by David Barron. Uh, he implemented the 
uh, they fixed uh, <coughs> initially. And it, it, it's really uh, very interesting. Uh, there are even like craziest um, ways to do stuff like, like uh, data extraction, like using SVG filters and figuring out how long they run. And uh, so it's, it's a const, constant uh, cat and mouse game between attackers and browser vendors that try to find ways to prevent that from happening. Uh, it, it looks very much like in the cryptography uh, world where uh, you want your algorithm to run in constant time if possible. If not, you, you use some other techniques. <coughs> um, so one way to, to have more control over your, your, your website security is uh, to use content security policies, uh, the CSPs. And uh, that's something that a site developer can use to prevent third party attacks by uh, really enforcing rules about uh, what, kind of, um, what, what kind of URLs can be used for lo loading scripts or style sheets or basically anything you can load, even fonts, workers. <coughs> Uh, any media file and so on. You can also define navigation patterns like preventing a site to navigate to some third party origin. You can decide which, what kind of form actions are allowed. You can, you can uh, control mixed content blocking. You can uh, add sandboxing similar to what we can do on iframes. So that's a pretty comprehensive list of uh, capabilities that you can turn on or off mostly uh, with CSPs. Um, this is uh, configured by this either a HTTP header or uh, you can use a meta tag in your HTML page that, that has the same meaning as a HTTP header. And, and one, one very useful um, uh, feature there is that you can enable some reporting of uh, CSP variations. So you basically specify the URL of uh, a server, and uh, when when something is uh, <coughs> happening, uh, the browser will post content describing the, the policy variation to your server. So if you if you run a site that like accepts third party content like user generated content, it's it's a good idea to uh, turn on uh, reporting to to know if if anything is happening. So, uh, quick recap. I think overall, it's it's a pretty good uh, situation. I mean, it's a pretty comprehensive uh, suite of, of mechanism for uh, web security. And so that was mostly what I described before: a set of uh, designs and APIs that we can use. Browser vendors and add like more implementation-specific measures, uh, site isolation. Uh, is site iteration is um, Jan talked a bit about it is uh, making sure that every origin runs in its own uh, OS process and that's mostly uh, the push for that happen when uh, we've seen uh, CPU bugs that that led to uh, data leaks across processes <coughs> so uh, yeah, Blink, Gecko have site isolation. I'm not sure about WebKit, but that's coming everywhere. That, that, that causes a lot of complexity in uh, web runtimes, especially when you do navigation or when you have like multiple origins loaded in the same page because of iframes or workers and so on. Um, there's also, yeah, OS level sandboxing with uh, SEPCOMP, BPF, uh, various uh, secured IPC mechanism. Uh, address space, layout randomization, all that kind of things are used to uh, mitigate code execution attacks mostly. Um, browser tends also to use uh, different uh, processes to run code that we know is a bit more um, subject to attacks. Typically, like now, any media decoding usually happens in its own process because we know that media decoders are could um, have, have a fairly high uh, attack surface level <coughs> and uh, GPU code also now. So all that is like, yeah, to make sure that you can run 
untrusted code safely. So that, that's good for the users. And also that ensures that sites are sandboxed for, from each other so that if, uh, if you run a site, you're protected against some malicious third party website getting data from, from your, your origin. <clears throat> but that doesn't tell anything about how a given site protects their own users. Because uh, that part is mostly privacy. It's not much security. And, and privacy and security, they, they go together, but they're, they're not the same. Um, of course, you cannot have privacy without security, because once your security is, is broken, like everything is off. But even if you have very, very good security, you, you may have like absolutely no privacy. Like I'm sure that, like honestly, sure that Google has the, probably the best security on their servers and so on. Like you, but but you don't have pretty much privacy with them, because they don't consider themselves part of the privacy stripe model. So. Privacy is mostly about user agency, which means like individual autonomy, making sure that people can make choices that they understand. Um, and that means that you should not ask users stuff that they cannot give meaningful answers for themselves. Uh, that, that's, that's kind of limiting in some ways. Um, in, at, the, at the broader level, there are some features like uh, yeah, tracking protection, fingerprint protection, that you can ask people to make choices on. It's kind of like, usually you, you, you see the results of your actions there. Yeah? So uh, like some sites will break and, and, and you can help them saying, hey, try to disable tracking protection and see if it works better. Uh, permission prompts are another example. So permission prompts are actually very interesting. You can ask people, uh, and prompt them if the prompt leads to something that is really meaningful, that has like something that you can clearly understand. So here's a, a classic example of you're using a, a video chat service and you can be prompted to decide whether you give camera access and microphone access and which one you choose. It's very clear what's gonna happen. Same for geolocation. If, if Google Maps asks you, do you want to, to give your geolocation access? It's very clear what, what, what can be the consequences. <clears throat> but for some situations, it's, it's not really usable. Uh, when we were working on Firefox OS, we had a lot of new APIs, and I were like considered powerful slash dangerous uh, that were useful to bring uh, uh, web capabilities a bit more up to par with what's called native. And that, that's a bunch of capabilities you don't want to grant by default to the web at large. But you cannot either ask users for consent because it's, it's too technical or it just doesn't make sense. Like we, we have a TCP socket API. Uh, what, what does that mean to ask a user, do you want to let this page use TCP sockets? What, what is it gonna do with this socket? Where do you, are you gonna connect to? Well, it, it makes no sense. You cannot make a decision. Even, even us that are very technical, we, we will not know what to answer. So <clears throat> people have, have been thinking about solutions about, uh, to, to, for, to solve that problem for a while. Uh, in Firefox OS, we decided to uh, go with signed code and, and signed package code, basically. So this, this powerful APIs were only uh, usable for uh, code that was um, signed by Mozilla, basically, and, and packaged. Then you would install your package, and locally, we, we grant a uh, randomized um, origin to this, to this code, and so you can locally link to it. It's, it solves kind of like the problem of not granting uh, API access to uh, random untrusted code, but we lost uh, linkability overall because you could, you could not link to an app from uh, the open web because you first need to install it and, and anyway, we, you cannot guess the URL. So uh, that was kind of a problem, but at the time that we, we didn't really figure out a better solution. Uh, around, uh, around the same time or a bit later, Google started 
what some project called like Project Fugu, it's an umbrella for a bunch of different API work. And they were very, uh, they were very uh, pushy about saying, yeah, we don't need that kind of thing. It's fine, we can prompt users, we can use picker APIs instead, and it's gonna be fine. Uh, and we, we always disagreed with that on the, on the Firefox side, and mostly because we disagreed on the threat model. We, we always ask them, what happens if, if the server is, is, is uh, attacked by uh, and compromised, and it starts to serve malicious code? What, how do you protect your users against that? Usually, the only answer, answer they had is like, well, we have the safe browsing service, so it, it should catch that, but it's, it catches stuff after the fact. Like, uh, and at the same time, they were like, pushing for something like web USB, where you can do something like refreshing your phone with it. I mean, if, if it takes a week to detect that, that someone has uh, compromised the server serving new Android images, uh, it, there's some real damage done. So it's, they would say, yeah, it's a trade-off, uh, we know, blah, blah. Um, well, last year, or yeah, maybe probably last year, uh, Google started to push something called isolated web apps. And uh, it's actually just a Firefox OS security model. We visited to just use web bundles instead of zip packages. But apart from that, it's, it's exactly the same thing. Oh, yeah, it's, so you have, you have signed code that is packaged in a web bundle with a CSP. Very, very similar. Um, um, yeah, so web bundles, they come with their own challenges. Uh, I think. I think this effort by Google is a bit tainted by their previous AMP work. Uh, so I'm a bit cautious about what they're doing there. <coughs> um, and, and, and so once you, once you add this um, sign code, one, one issue with the signing mechanism is that the signature is used to for both verifying the, the package integrity. You could, you could verify that the code has not been changed but, and, and also as a trust anchor. Like you, you, would, you would say, okay, it's been signed by Dietrich, or it will be, yeah, and, and so you trust your code. Uh, anyway, you, you, you have the same, <laughs> you, you use the same mechanism for two different purposes, that data integrity and, and trust uh, chain, which is not, not great. Um, uh, so we, we need something a bit better there. Um, and, and, and a full trust chain is, is very complicated. Like if you, if you go up your, your, your software and hardware um, tool chains, hardware supply chain, it's, it's very hard to trust everything. So you have to make a choice, decide what your threat model is. And I think for like everyday people, if you're not the target of some uh, state agency, you can, you can consider that you can trust your device at the hardware level, trust the OS vendor and, and, and the web runtime vendor. They probably are not malicious against you. Uh, but, but you still want to make sure that no malicious code is being served, executed, and no private data is being leaked. Um, so that, that's still difficult. We, uh, I don't think the, the current model of the web uh, has any good solution for that. Uh, so, yeah, a <laughs> uh, few months ago, Robin uh, sent a proposal about, about something uh, in this space and uh, called web tiles. And honestly, when I, when I read it, I was like, why didn't we think about that sooner? That, that looks pretty obviously a good solution, at least for some of these problems. So I'm going to introduce a bit uh, what, what this is about. Uh, so it's, it's a, the different approach to this permission packaging problem. Uh, instead of starting with a uh, state where we are, we are kind of unsafe and we want to close the, the gaps, we start with a very safe by default uh, state, okay? So that means that like a web tile is safe by default. You, you, you know that we are gonna use mechanism to ensure that uh, it, it, it provides you privacy. 
we also, because they cannot leak data, we can then grant them very powerful APIs. They can, they can access anything on your device. If they cannot leak it out to the world, it's fine to let them access stuff. There are some nuances to that, like user consent still uh, can be required to, to prevent like uh, fooling your, your, your device with data or, or so on. But, but it's much easier to figure out than um, with the open web. Content accessibility, that, that gives you integrity guarantees. Uh, so that, that's very nice. That doesn't solve the trust issue. I think, I think we need to figure out the trust part uh, independently, and mostly because for me, trust is as much a social issue uh, and as, as a technical one. So we, sh we, we, we can do that in a, in a very different way. Maybe uh, you can use just your address book to see like if uh, several people in your address book trust some app, you can trust it too, and uh, or, or other signals that you could use for that. <coughs> um, the web tiles say yeah, they are bundled and linkable, so we, we can use stable URLs thanks to um, content-based addressing, and we know that we need a set of resources. So even if we don't create a package like a zip file, we need some way to describe that we have a set of resources that are linked together in, that, make, that make a bundle. Uh, the, the, the way that really works, I don't think you need to create a zip as long as you have like the list of, um, of resources and you ensure that they are pinned properly. So uh, what that could look like is uh, very similar to, we are, to IPFS column slash slash uh, URLs, we, we can create a tile um, protocol handler and uh, we use a very strict CSP so that we make sure that all uh, that uh, all documents using this tile URLs won't be able to access uh, remote content. We can uh, install them or register them in the user agent. Uh, the, 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 the demo I will uh, talk about uh, for that, we, we just leverage uh, the PWA, the Progressive Web Apps Manifest with some extensions. Uh, so that means that we are very much uh, reusing a lot of the existing web stack. It's, it's a fairly minimal addition. It's kind of a customization um, with a custom protocol handler, uh, dedicated CSP, but we, we use the CSP mechanism as it is. So it, it's very much into a progressive improvement. It's, it's not like a radical departure saying we are throwing everything out. It's what can we do to uh, improve the current stack uh, with this new uh, mechanism. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important to consider what kind of capabilities you can provide with that. Because once you have something that is limited in a way to local content, you have to think about how does that fit into the, 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 the web at large still. Um, so um, Robin talked a bit about web activities and that uh, key piece for that, like activities are similar to Android intents. That means that you register some capability saying, oh, I'm an app that can, or I'm some kind of code that can, uh, provide some, uh, some function. And several of these apps can be installed and if uh, some other piece of code requires this uh, capability, we will let the system or the user choose which app can uh, be used for that. So it's very open because you don't have to bake the list of capabilities in the runtime itself. It's very flexible. You can define them uh, as you go. <coughs> Tiles also can be run without uh, a user visible UI, or you can have a UI, and, um, and that's, that's, that's possible, uh, we'll see uh, later because of uh, the way it is implemented. Um, discovery is important. Uh, it's, I think it's a bit tricky to do in, in a way that is not centralized, um, but um, that's still something that, that needs to happen. Installing, sharing uh, tiles is important too. <coughs> so, uh, 
So um, based on these ideas, I started to prototype uh, around the tile protocol handler in, in Capilun. So um, just a quick recap about Capilun. It's a very experimental web-based OS. It's, uh, it's based on the Firefox OS code base, but with uh, additional um, support for, for distributed web uh, protocols and, and mechanisms. So we have support for IPFS, IPNS protocol handlers. Uh, for that, we use a local IPFS node on device that is based on uh, number zero, previously called IRO, now called Beetle code. Um, so that, that's all the Unix FS, basically, uh, IP, IPFS code. Um, we use the IDs and UCANs for permissions and, and uh, uh, the IDs mostly for uh, user uh, IDs. We can pin content to uh, third party providers where we started with estuary, but we could do web tree storage or anything else as easily. We can exchange locally content over the using the, 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 the local node. Uh, and usually you just create a QR code uh, that has the IPFS URL and, and you can uh, exchange locally uh, content like that. And now we, ha we have tiles. Uh, if you want to try it, we have builds available for some Android devices, some Linux phones like the Pine phone and the Librem. And, and the easiest way to try it actually is on, on desktop. For Linux, Mac, it's very easy to set up a, a, a test environment. So the tiles in Capilun, what we did is that we added a, a tile protocol handler in Gecko, and it's configured to uh, use a default CSP, which is a CSP which is very, very strict. Uh, very restrictive in terms of like you, you can do no outside network access except except for some uh, WebRTC things that, that we need still. Um, the installation is very similar to a PWA installation. The only difference is that we have a, a, an additional step at the end of the installation where in the manifest we added the list of resources that are part of a tile. And so we will make sure that we fetch not just the manifest, but all the resources that are needed to run that app so that we ensure that uh, the app is pinned locally in the, in the block store of uh, the IPFS node. <clears throat> and uh, we leverage the web activity support that we already had in Capilun. So there are three, nothing, uh, nothing specific two tiles there. The interesting thing is uh, for headless support is that the, when you call a web activity, uh, the provider actually gets uh, an event dispatched to a service worker. So at this level, you can decide if you need a UI or not. And if you, if you don't need a UI, you just have like a uh, headless service worker running uh, and returning data or, uh, if needed. Uh, to help with like the whole uh, creation and, and installation flow, uh, there's a tiles app now in Capilun where you can choose existing uh, tiles either uh, already installed on your, on your device or some um, sample ones that uh, we created and, and do uh, some fairly basic editing and, and changes locally before you publish them or that you try them. So yeah, a few use cases quickly. Um, the first one is that uh, it's a headless one. So in, in Capilun's home screen, when, when you, there's a, uh, a search field that uh, pulls data from various sources internally, from the navigation history, from your contacts, from um, apps installed, and so on. Uh, now we also uh, can use a tile to provide um, results there. So here, the sample uses a, a universal calculator converter that can do a bunch of things. So uh, here I'm, I'm just uh, um, converting uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit to do some baking, and uh, that's, that's pretty useful. Uh, it shows that um, you really don't have to do any UI-specific work. And, and you can embed any, any code uh, as such. 
here it's, it's compiled to WASM. The second one is showing like more like document editing, processing, uh, um, all the media files in Capilun are exposed through a, a virtual file system. And in the files ma in file manager now, when like you have a, an, an image, for instance, you can use a tile to edit the image. So here I just open the um, logo in a, uh, what we call an inline activity. Uh, so the size is a bit uh, smaller than full screen. And I, I just inverted the image color and you end up with the updated uh, version of the image. Here also, yeah, it's, uh, it's done using mostly WASM code uh, for the image processing. But you could, you could plug in whatever you want. <clears throat> and, and everything is done on device, nothing leaves the device. Uh, the last one, I think it's, it's, it's a bit more uh, involved, but it's, it's very interesting. Uh, so it shows up, it shows what you can do with two devices. Uh, so we, we have a capability in Capilun to do device discovery and pairing. So it's just using MDNS to do the device discovery. So here I have a scenario with uh, a phone and something that is more like a media center um, device. <coughs> We, we can consider that on the first, that we, we paired the two devices. And then in your contacts, if you have a contact matching the, the other device, you can see that you have this uh, green button that says launch app. And that means that you can, you can launch an app that will work on both devices at the same time. So the target device will accept it. And, and then the SDK helps with setting up just a communication channel between both devices. And here I use that to, uh, first we send the tile to the, to the remote device. The remote device doesn't even know initially which app really will run. So the phone that has published the tile sends the tile URL to the media center. The media center fetches everything, install locally, launch the app, and we set up the communication and it's like 10 lines of JS for the, the app author because the SDK does most of the, um, most of the setup behind the scenes. And then once you have this uh, communication channel, you can do whatever you want between both instances. In this case, it's a very basic remote media player. So I can pick up um, uh, a local uh, video file on, on the phone side. I just expose it uh, using the new IRO to test the uh, streaming capabilities. And I send, the, uh, technically I send a new a ticket representing this uh, media stream to the remote side and it just plays it. And, and that's, that's pretty amazing. That's something I want to do just to replace my Android TV because, <laughs> uh, and, and it looks like it's very promising in, in this regard, it should work. But it's, it's, it's just one sample, once you have like, two device paired and, and a channel established, uh, you, you can do like, yeah, multiplayer games, whatever you want. So what, yeah, what we should do next, I mean, there's still a lot of exploration to do around what kind of content or what kind of apps you can build with that. Um, games, uh, content archives, you could even like embed indexes with your tiles so you can get them being searchable easily you could do mashup with uh, local data. Uh, you, could, you could do uh, filtering or recommendation algorithm for uh, social feed applications. Like I would love to have a way to customize my Mastodon uh, uh, feed. Right now it's very limited. If we could embed something like that, that would be nice. Um, and I, I guess like, yeah, I, I, I'm sure people will have a lot more ideas. Um, on my side, I still have like, some questions that are not answered yet. Um, that's the question of discovery. Yeah, do we, do we, we, need, we need a way to find tiles, but uh, do we want like to have a centralized search engine kind of directory? That's, that doesn't look great, uh, but, but is, that, is that anything better right now? Um, we also need to be able to provide updates to tiles. And that, that means that we, we, we need some kind of mutability story, but we also need some pretty stable naming. So uh, 
um, yeah, that's that's a, that's a whole problem or around, around mutability. But but it's very important to get updates. Like you you cannot like think that shipping software that cannot be updated, like even just for bug fixes, that's not acceptable. Um, and I, I wonder if there's something to do uh, in the compute over data in, in general with tiles, because it's very much a different way of bringing data and code together. So maybe there's something to explore around that. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you.